right. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to winter. <laughs> On Tuesday, it was 97 when I left. And now, um, not so much, right? But it's going to be back up, I think, in the mid-80s, at least by this weekend. Is that right? However, yeah. it did allow me the opportunity to wear a jacket instead of just a, instead of just a vest. <clears throat> so today, we are talking about consumer behavior. And hopefully, this will come up. The uh, video was not working when I walked in, and I tried it several different times. Sometimes you just have to shut down the whole system and get it to restart in order to get it to boot. But we can go ahead and start. It's doing that. Let's go to the correct display. It's not going to move the display. Technology is wonderful until it doesn't work. So what I will do, no, I'm still not doing it. Still not working. Let's go to blank. Let's go to left. We'll see if I can get it to come back. Probably not. So in case the technology is not going to work today, because we had the camera issues last time. Um, for those of you that are in the extended classroom, either on YouTube or on, um, on WebEx, you can pull up the PowerPoints. I've already loaded them for today. For those of you who have your devices, um, you can look at it because it looks like the camera is not going to work at all. Or the, um, not the camera, the projector is not going to work for some reason today. It may come back halfway through class, but since I got considerable a considerable distance in um, my first class, I need to probably go ahead and start. We'll see if it'll come back in a minute. Um, so we need to talk about consumer behavior today. And when we talked about goals, so we're going to go back for a minute to when we talked about goals. This is, again, how all of this stuff sort of integrates. We talked about how it was, it was possible to pursue an irrational goal in a rational perspective. And the reason I bring this back up now is because when we were talking about goals and strategies, that was sort of important. But of course, that relates to consumer behavior because ultimately what we want to do is we want to use our goals to influence either the people that we want to uh, give us a job or be friends with or whatever from a personal level. But from a business perspective, we want to influence consumers. So marketing's foundational disciplines, and I make merciless fun of both of these disciplines. Marketing's foundational disciplines are, of course, economics, which I've talked about before, and made fun of economists and said that you know economics is really nothing more than renaming things that we all know intuitively with fancy terms, like you know maximization of utility when we're talking about ethics with stuff that we all understand intuitively, that is, get the most bang for your buck. The other is psychology. So consumer behavior is largely the psychology portion of marketing. So those are the two foundational disciplines of marketing. Uh, um, from a historical perspective, economics, and specifically agricultural economics, and then um, psychology. And psychology, I always say, is the closest thing to witchcraft we teach on a college campus. You know, oh, lay on the couch, tell me your problems, and I'll try to solve them. Modern psychiatry, using, again, um, brain imaging, suggests that all of that was maybe not, it's starting to suggest that maybe all of that was not really all that helpful. Like, lay on the couch and let me figure out your problems, interpret your dreams, all of that. Turns out that going through that, in many instances, just causes you to relive the trauma. At least that's what some current brain, um, you know, cognitive psychiatry uh, or medicine would suggest, and that, that that may not be terribly helpful. Um, nonetheless, that is one of the foundational disciplines, and so I think it's important that we understand something about consumer behavior. And consumer behavior is really 
the merging of classical economics with psychology. So um, economic theorists assume that we are rational actors, right? Uh, and what, what do we mean by rational actors? Well, the rational actor model assumes a number of things. And since I don't have a PowerPoint today, because it's not working, it assumes people pursue goals. Now, I'm going to reverse it. So last time I asked you, is it possible to pursue an irrational goal from a rational perspective? And we said, yes, it was. And the, the classic example of that, the most extreme example of that, of course, is Nazi Germany under Hitler. Uh, if you want to eliminate an entire race, uh, they did it in a rational, comprehensive way. It's an irrational goal, right? Now I will turn the question around. Is it possible to pursue a rational goal in an irrational manner? Is it possible to pursue a rational goal right, in an irrational manner, in an, ir in an irrational way? This is the critical thinking challenge for today. Yes, who said yes? Okay. Who's Dean? Give us an example, and you will have to either text me or email me to remind me to give you points, since I can't give you a duck, obviously. You know this. How can you do that? Can you give an example? Okay, yeah, I think that's exactly I think that's exactly right. So the answer was um, is in case for those of you in YouTube uh, land couldn't hear him because the the audio is really weak um, on there and I turned it up full volume that you could pursue a rational goal by not having any plan at all, right? Just sort of going after, just saying that's like okay, let's think about this. I'm going to get a degree in professional sales and marketing from the University of Central Oklahoma. Oh, what classes should I take? Oh, I'll just flip open the course catalog and see what looks sort of interesting. Oh, here's one that looks interesting. Recreation and leisure lifestyle with field experience. We have a class. We have this class. I took this class. I thought this will be an easy class. Like this will be, this will be, I, I, I know loads about recreating. I do it all the time. I'm a master recreator. I thought this will be an easy A. It was one of the hardest classes I took. It required the field experience. Was It required us to go to eight in a 16-week period, eight different recreation facilities and meet with the director of those facilities and do a report. And we had to spend a minimum of, I think the instructor at the time, actually the professor, she's now an associate dean in the College of Education. She's one of my, my dear, very dear friends, um, she, uh, she required us to spend, I think, two and a half hours at least at each facility. So you're supposed to meet not just with the director, but with staff, and you were supposed to uh, see how customers interacted. This was really a consumer ethnography uh, experience. You're supposed to go out and see how people are actually, so go, go to a golf course. Well, for those of us who play golf, I didn't really need to spend two and a half hours. I mean, it took a, I mean, it took a long time. And the reason I point this out is because if you're going to get a degree in marketing and professional sales, taking recreation and leisure lifestyle, just saying, oh, that sounds like an interesting class, um, is not going to get you there, right? I mean, you'll, you might get there eventually, but if you just sort of go through the course catalog and look at stuff that you think looks fun, you're, you're not going to take five years, you're going to take 10 or 15, right? So rational actor consumer behavior, and this is... Economists take this as, as goal, that people pursue goals, that in the pursuit of those goals, now you can have low-level rationality. You can pursue, again, irrational goals from a rational perspective, or you can even pursue rational goals in sort of a lackadaisical manner that doesn't, that doesn't recognize, that doesn't resemble rational actor model. But what, what the classical model suggests, and we're gonna, I, I'm going to make an argument that maybe this model doesn't work real well in the real world, but what it says is people pursue goals. So we have wants and desires, right? 
And in order to, to achieve those wants and desires, um, you plan, right? So you've got goals, and as part of that, you're going to plan. Well, what do you want to do if you want to achieve the goal of getting a degree in professional sales? Well, you're going to come, you know, I had a student that said, I really want to do this professional sales thing. I, he took my professional sales class. He took my principal's marketing class in which I told him, you know, you can make a lot of money in professional sales. These are the stats. We're the only one that has 100% placement of our majors and minors. And, you know, about 80% of our, our graduates are making over six figures in, in their first year and et cetera, et cetera. And I, may, I did my good pitch and sold him. And he said, um, now I'm going to go to OU after this semester. And I said, well, then you're not going to pursue that, 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 that goal. And he said, well, why not? And I said, oh, you doesn't have that degree for thing, right? So you're going to make a plan. You're going to have to, if you want to get a degree in professional sales, who's the only school in the state that has a degree program in professional selling, a major and minor? Well, it's UCF, right? So you're going to have to come to UCO or you're going to have to go to Baylor and Waco or UT Dallas has one. UT Arlington has a sales program. OSU is trying to develop theirs. And it's, it's a really odd experience for me because normally in the past, we go to OSU or OU to see how it's done and OSU's come to us to see how this is done, how we develop the sales program. So you, you formulate a plan. And what does that plan begin with? Well, it starts with your recognition, your problem recognition. Um, depending on how complex the problem is will we'll depend on whether or not you have to go beyond your internal search, your evoke set of things you know. So let's take just a very simple example. It's uh, going to be, um, <clears throat> let's see, 11.15, no, I'm sorry, 10.45 when we get out of here. I forgot what time it started, 9.30. So it'll be 10.45, which is getting close to lunchtime, right? Particularly if you're like me and you've been up since 5 a.m. So it's getting close to lunchtime. Uh, you know, I've got this problem. My stomach is rumbling and I'm, I'm hungry. I'm probably not going to have to formulate much of a plan. Now, one of the things I'll make an argument is that if you are truly a rational actor, you really would think about this. And I was listening to an economist on Freakonomics Radio the other day as I was driving down the interstate because I'm a nerd. That's what I sort of do. I listen to lectures on on um, my phone, and I also listen to Freakonomics Radio, and there's an economist, um, and the journalist who's, who's the host of Freakonomics Radio, they started a new one which is called No Stupid Questions, where basically this academic economist and this journalist who wrote Freakonomics, the, the journalism part of the duo, um, she and, and the journalist guy, it's not the same economist, I cannot remember what her name is, that does the No Stupid Questions, but she and the journalist half of Freakonomics, um, and I can't remember his name because I'm, I'm really bad with names anymore, um, just sit there and ask each other questions. And one of the questions that they were asking was, are you a maximizer or a satisficer? Now, under classical theory, classical economic theory, you want to do what? You want to maximize your utility, right? And so she was saying that even in simple decisions, like what should I have for lunch, she wants to have what's the best lunch for her. So she has to start thinking about all of these different things like, well, what's nutritious? What can I get you conveniently? That's, so now we've got two categories, nutritious and convenient. You know, what is the best, what price range do I want to stick to? What's my budget? And so she starts thinking about all these things in order to maximize her utility. And it turns out most people don't do that. Most people engage in satisficing rather than maximizing. What does that mean? So for example, you're hungry at 1045. Well, what's close? Vending the vending machines, those are that that's got really nothing of nutritional value, probably, right? I guess the peanuts, they have peanuts in there. Um, those maybe have some nutritional value, some almonds. Uh, what else is close? The food court. And I get to go, as a result, I get to go on my tirade again. Because what's in the food court? Chick-fil-A. There's a Chick-fil-A and a Starbucks. Two tools of the devil. Right there, right? 
And a lot of people, you know, might just go pick up the Chick-fil-A or the Starbucks. They also have, I think, uh, fat tire over there. Is that not anymore? Not anymore. Well, they got rid of the flat tire and the two tacos because of social distancing. Oh, how is I don't know. I guess maybe because, like, for like the taco one, like the line for that would be going this way, and the line for the sub place oh. would be going this way, so they didn't understand. So wow, that, that seems crazy. like a logistics problem that's just <laughs> too crazy to handle. Maybe they could have come over and asked Dr. Genshev in my department who teaches logistics. Like, you know, you put a line outside and you only let a certain number of people in. And the that's area. what they're doing too. So it doesn't make right. sense as to why they just like. Okay, so you've got you've got Chick Fil A now and what the sandwich place? The sandwich place and the like sushi, like rice and meat bowl place. Okay, so you know. None of those sound appealing to me because obviously we know that I have this visceral hatred of Chick-fil-A. I don't like Starbucks. You can get food at Starbucks. I hate Starbucks. Right? I, I, have, I have this friend. It's just so annoying. I don't even know why we're friends because, like, I want to go to Starbucks. And he's like, you know, their food is just so much better and more clean. And he gets basically – Starbucks has what is basically what McDonald's has sold forever, which is called a sausage McMuffin. <laughs> It's an egg McMuffin with sausage and cheese. And he's like, at Starbucks, it's clean. I'm like, no sausage is clean. Brett's none. It's the same thing you can get for a dollar at McDonald's. Not saying that you should, but I'm just pointing these little things out, right? Um, so... Problem recognition, then we're going to engage in a search. Now, if we go beyond just I'm hungry to something that's more complex in the decision making process, we're going to have to go to external sources and start looking at external, you know, like if we're going to buy a house, for example, you know, what kinds of things are important? What's our budget? This is not something, you know, it's not a big stretch to go spend uh, five to ten bucks at, at um, you know, the devil's food stand over over in the university center, um, it is a big deal to spend 250. What's the average house price in Edmond? It's over $250,000 now, right? So that, that's a major decision. So we're gonna have to engage in more searching, right? Then we're gonna evaluate the alternatives that we have and evaluation of the alternatives you know, what kind of house can we afford? What neighborhoods do we want to live in? What are the schools like if we have kids? Things like that. Evaluate the alternatives. Make a decision. And then evaluate the decision. Now, this is really critical, and I want to point this out, this because this is really important for you as consumers to become better consumers and so that you don't necessarily lose confidence or heart. You cannot always evaluate the quality of the decision. And in fact, in many instances, you cannot evaluate the quality of the decision based upon the outcomes that occur as a result of that decision. The decision making may be very sound and you can still have bad outcomes. And that does not mean that you made a bad decision. And I'll give you an example of that from my own, my own life. My brother had a Nissan Maxima. And this was when Nissan Maximas were really good cars. Um, I don't think Nissan has quite the quality standards that they once had, and they were really good cars. My brother had a Nissan Maxima. My father had a Nissan Maxima. My best friend, who was my boss here at UCO, he was the chief legal officer here at UCO, and I was um, his assistant uh, counsel for, for a number of years here, needed a new car. His car was old. It was breaking down and he needed, he's one of these guys that drives a car forever and ever and ever until it just falls apart, the wheels come off. And he'd driven my father's car, he'd driven my brother's car, he liked both of them. He wanted a car that was you could travel and take road trips in, you could get his family in, his dad, um, other people in to the car, and a Nissan Maxima fit that bill. But he wanted something that was sort of sporty. That was basically the Nissan Maxima. The alternatives, and he wanted a Japanese car because he thought that the Japanese cars at that time, according to Consumer Reports and all that, were far superior <coughs> to um, to the American models. So, what are your what are your choices at that point in time in the late 1990s and early 2000s? Well, it was Honda, Nissan, um, and Toyota, 
right? Now they have their luxury brands, but he wasn't interested in that. So it was Honda, Nissan, uh, or Toyota. Well, what are the, the comparable cars in that set? Well, there's the Nissan Maxima, there's the Toyota Camry, and there's the Honda Accord. The Honda Accord and the Toyota Camry are the most boring, dull cars on the planet. I mean, literally so boring that people in comas get up and walk away to get out of them, right? The Honda will, will run forever. I mean, it'll just go forever. I mean, Hondas just will go forever, great cars. Um, but they're boring. I mean, there's, you know, a Maxima was actually, it handled well, it was kind of sporty, had a better suspension, it had better, you know, zero to 60. He did all of this research on Consumer Reports to make sure this was the right decision. He made the right decision. And almost instantly from the, from the moment he purchased the car, he, he took six months to make this decision to buy a car. As his car is limping along and been in the service center and Guthrie saying, I don't know if we can keep her on the road much longer. You, you need to make this decision quickly. He finally makes a decision. He buys the Nissan Maxima. And almost from the word go, he says, that was the worst decision I ever made because the car, like within three weeks, the water pump went out. Two weeks later, the fuel pump went out. A month later, the car started having major electrical problems. Like you'd just be driving down the road and the windows would just go down. 60 miles down. And then all the lights would come on in the dash and it would just stop. I mean, it, like at, in the middle of the highway, and we literally were having to push it off to the side of the road. And he said, that was the worst. He took it in and said, "I, you got, take this car, take it back, take it back. And they said, do you want another Max? And he said, I am never buying another car from you people. And he went bottom on a court. And he said, that, you know, that was the worst decision I made. And I said, no, the decision making was sound. You did the research. It turns out you were unlucky, right? The research suggested that at that time, Nissan Maxima was a great car for what she wanted. That was good decision making. It ended up with poor results, right? Now, what we want is that on the whole, by and large in the aggregate, if you do this kind of decision making, you're more likely to get better results, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're always gonna get good results, right? Um, so, so I mean, one of the things I want you to think about as consumers is to not become despondent and not give up on sort of striving for this rational actor model in your own lives and in your own consumer decision-making processes. Um, you know, it, it could be that you decide, you know, that Chipotle is clean and healthier than Taco Bell. And I think by and large on the whole, it is. I'm not sure that it's all that healthy to begin with, but I think in comparison, you know, but it's sort of like saying things like a granola bar is healthier than Reese's peanut butter cups. Is that true? Marginally. It has about the same number of calories. It has almost as much sugar in those Nature Valley granola bars as Reese's peanut butter cups do. It's more, it has, what it does have is it may have small amounts of fiber, which are marginally better than for you than, than you know, just chocolate and peanut butter, but, you know, engage in the rational actor model, even though maybe that's not what we always do. And even though sometimes the results are not necessarily what we expect. So the rational actor model, um, part of this is with regard to our goals and our needs, it relies on things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So for those of you who have it pulled up, for those of you who don't, it's a pyramid structure. And at the bottom of the structure, these first two levels are what we might call basic human needs. The bottom level is physiological. So that's water, food, right? Those are your basic. The next layer is safety. The next layer is belonging, esteem, and then self-actualization. 
<clears throat> now Maslow intimates in this scheme, and the reason we need to think about this as marketers, is he intimates that you cannot move from one level to the next unless the needs at that lower level are satisfied. And I think that's basically true when you are down here. And I can give you an example. If you are starving to death in Oklahoma, and you are homeless, and you see people with wealth and money around you, you might break into a home and steal something, and that's going to be very unsafe in places like Oklahoma where we have a high percentage of the people that have concealed carry, oh, and you don't even have to have concealed carry anymore, and oh, concealed carry never even applied in your home, did it, right? I, and if you're in somebody's home, and in Oklahoma, we're fascinated with shooting people, and if you're in somebody's home, you, you know, I, I mean, you can't shoot them in the back, but there is a presumption that they're going to do you harm, and you have the right to, to take their life. Right? So this may turn out poorly for you. So, but if you're starving to death, you may, may, you may take that risk. You may not be concerned with safety needs. But much beyond that, I'm not sure that Maslow is correct and, and, or, or that his intimation of this is correct, and I'll, I'll tell you all. I'll give you some examples. Um, however, this is important in thinking about this because... In order to get people to behave, if we, are, if we are social scientists and we want people to behave in a certain way, you have to recognize their needs, right? I mean, as, as marketers, we have to recognize their needs. There was a famous case of this. There was actually a movie that was made about it that came out about seven years ago called The Pentagon Papers, based on a real story. And it involves a guy named Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was one of the um, modern people, contemporary people, to take his top secret classification and give documents to the New York Times um, and have them print documents, much like Edward Snowden would do many, many years later. Some of you maybe have heard of Edward Snowden or know who he is, right? He basically released a whole bunch of documents. He's now, I believe, um, still hiding out in Russia, um, trying to avoid extradition to the United States. He leaked a whole bunch of documents that you know, were not terribly flattering to the United States government. Ellsberg worked for a company called the RAND Corporation, which stands for Research and Development. And they have a lot of government contracts that um, deal with top secret information or secret information. Right? There are levels of classification. During the Vietnam era, the United States wanted to get the South Vietnamese and the peasants to support the war against the North Vietnamese. We, we had a, what was called in that, that time period a bipolar world. We had an East versus West, and it was communism versus capitalism. And we were fighting it. In, an, in this ideological struggle, because we believed that communism presented an existential threat. In other words, a threat to our very existence, our way of life, our, our being. And the Russians were, were the major player in that. And they had all these satellite countries, and we had satellite countries. And people operated within these defines of these boundaries. Well, we got into several wars. Immediately after World War II, when the Russians started grabbing up their satellite countries in Eastern Europe and other places, we started trying to counter them, or maybe they countered us, whichever way you look at it. And one of the places that we went into and started fighting a war was in North Korea. China, um, the Nationalist Party, which had taken over, which had thrown overthrown the emperor and I'm condensing a whole lot of history here. Uh, historians would be would be horrified at my at my sort of condensation of this. But China had fallen to the communists. Um, the nationalists had thrown out the emperor, but they sort of allowed him to stay. There's a very nice movie about that called The Last Emperor, which you might want to see. 
Um, they let him stay in the Forbidden City and sort of be the titular head, but they they lost power to the communists um, under Chairman Mao, and and we were terrified when it started creeping into Korea. And we almost instantly after World War II went into Korea and started fighting a war. We pushed the communists back past the 58th parallel and started to head towards China, at which point the Chinese got involved and they pushed us back and we ended up at a draw basically where the Korean Peninsula had been split before. The same thing occurred or similar pattern occurred in Vietnam. And the United States government wanted to get the people in South Vietnam and in Vietnam who were peasants to be actively involved. And Ellsberg starts doing this research on it. And he, becomes, he becomes convinced that not only is it impossible, but it's probably unethical to get, get these people to, to um, engage. And, and the reason I point this out is because this is really a marketing plan. The United States government wanted to figure out how they could market this idea of being against communism. Well, if you're a peasant, right, philosophizing about who's better, communist or capitalist, that's somewhere up here, right? You're not going to reach these, no, no amount of marketing, no amount of propaganda is going to get to these people. So he starts releasing these papers to the New York Times. So I think it, there's maybe some truth, but we have to be very careful. With regard to safety, a lot of, you know, Maslow says, if we're concerned about safety, we can't be concerned about belonging and esteem, but I would think that a lot of us are concerned about safety. We're all wearing masks right now, and yet we're still concerned about, I mean, even though we're very concerned about safety, home alarm system sales are up. They've been going up for, for years and years and years. Actually, they may have been on a decline now, but for years and years and years, they were going up at a time when crime was actually declining in the United States. Why was that? Well, politicians had sold us on the idea that crime, George W. Bush did a very good job of selling us on the idea that crime was increasing and we all went out and bought alarm systems. And I point this out because even though we were concerned about our safety and we maybe didn't have our needs met, although maybe buying the alarm system met them, we still seem to have esteem and belonging needs in spite of that. But what I think we can take away as marketers from this is knowing how to meet those needs if people manifest them. Now, from an ethical standpoint, what a lot of people would say is we need to recognize that people are maybe engaging in irrational needs, and maybe we need to not do that. Maybe we can come up with better solutions. The other thing that I do agree with Maslow is he says most people never reach this. The self-actualization, this is, this is Socrates, this is uh, Plato, this is Aristotle sitting around in the lotus position um, thinking about uh, lofty thoughts, right? Um, and I, I think that's true. So recognizing needs and where people's needs are is enormously important in, in us being able to satisfy those needs. But it's also important for you as consumers to think about how maybe you can assess these needs. Right? So in regard to problem recognition, one of the things that plays a role um, is the actual self versus the idealized self and our perception of that. And the combination of the two, uh, actualized self and idealized self, will influence the products, services, and brands that we buy, that we purchase, and that we, um, that we use, right? So what is this? A lot of people, you know, you can see this in things like books like Dress for Success, right? The actual self versus the idealized self. What is it that you, if you want to be successful, the idea of the book Dress for Success was what? Now we've sort of gotten away from this because there's been this whole movement towards, you know, business casual and business casual has become enormously not business casual anymore um, in a lot of workplaces. but. There's been a movement, but you know, the idea is that there's this idealized self that you want, which is to be a successful business person. You look at your actual self and then um, react accordingly. 
In response to this, so if we think of rational actor, which I'll abbreviate as RA, as the thesis, well, what's the antithesis? Which this is another one of my Oklahoma to English dictionaries. When I was in high school, I had a teacher who kept telling me that the antithesis, the anti, which is the way it's spelled, antithesis, um, was X, and it's, it's pronounced antithesis. So the antithesis may be irrational actor theory. What irrational actor theory posits is that what I call irrational, it's called various names by various scholars, but what I call irrational actor is that people are not really rational. And we see this in Martin Lindstrom's biology, which I talked about before. So this is an example about how all of this sort of combines together. Lindstrom says we behave in very predictable and yet irrational ways. The fact that it's predictable, irrational behavior is, is highly predictable, by the way, but it's not necessarily rational. What does that mean, that we behave in irrational ways, um, according to these people who, who ascribe to this theory, like Martin Lindstrom? Well, Lindstrom says we just sort of go through the motions. We think that we're being rational, but most of the time we're not. Most of the time, as was talked about in this, this Freakonomics podcast, a lot of people are not even really satisficing. They're just reacting. They're like a tumbleweed going down the road, right? Because they don't have time. You see this in, in a movie like, in a documentary called Food, Inc., which deals with how we bring food to market. And again, I often, when I watch the movie, and when I think back about the movie, I, I want to become a vegetarian, and it lasts approximately a day each time I try. My family and I are now trying, in order to help reduce our carbon footprint, we're trying Meatless Mondays, where, where we don't, where we're vegetarians at least one day a week, in an attempt, because even if you don't believe in global warming, the mass production of cattle, poultry, and pork is doing enormous harm to our environment. It's doing enormous degradation. Even if you don't believe in global warming, just the runoff, the number, for example, in Oklahoma, the number of lakes that have had to been closed in the last 10 years as a result of E. coli uh, viral loads that were so high that it was literally toxic has increased enormously. That was never a case. When I was a kid growing up, you never heard about E. coli out. And why is, why is it that we have all this E. coli outbreaks? Well, they, they claim that, that some of it's from the geese that are flying down from Canada and, and pooping in the lakes. But it's also maybe from runoff from things like poultry and cattle and pork production. And one of the things that we know from this, and if you watch Food, Inc., they, they talk about this, is that it's not natural to feed cows corn. But if we feed cattle corn, and I know this is a kid who grew up on a cattle ranch whose father still still feeds cattle, and he doesn't, he's never fed corn, we've always done grass-fed feed. It increases the amount of E. coli in the gut of the cow something like a thousand fold, right? And so this is, this is really dangerous. So um, I am you know, like trying to do my part and maybe reduce my, my meaning. But one of the things that they highlight in Food, Inc. that highlights this irrational actor model is that, you know, there's this, this family that are living on the edge. They are a marginalized family. And they're telling them, you know, what you're eating is unhealthy. And, and the mother and father say, yeah, we realize that they live, I believe, um, in the documentary, this family lives in the... Um, Southern California area, which is enormously expensive. They have one car for both parents. So they have to drop their kids off at school uh, and then, you know, drop the wife off and then the husband or drop the husband off and the wife takes the car. I can't remember which. But in order to do that, you know, they're running for McDonald's basically because they, they get up, they have these kids, they got to get them fed and, and they just don't have time. They're just reacting. 
they're running through McDonald's, even knowing that the sausage McMuffin is probably not the best thing for you, right, to, to eat. The synthesis model of this <clears throat> is that with regard to high risk, so what we have is we have to look at this as high risk versus low risk. So high risk purchases versus low risk purchases. So what are high risk? Things like homes, cars, major appliances, low risk, things like lunch, toothpaste, you know, uh, paper towels, things like that are low risk. The synthesis model says that with regard to high risk, we actually do that. With regard to things like purchasing a home, we do engage in more analysis. What is that? Well, you can't just go purchase a home. The average home price in Edmond is above $250,000 now. Anybody got $250,000 just laying around in the bank? Probably not, right? And I think actually the current statistics are that the, the average home price in, in Edmond is, is uh, approaching um, $500,000, right? So we're gonna have to think about this. How are we gonna get financing for this home? Um, what kind of home can we really afford? You know, I mean, it's not just it's not just a matter of whether you can afford it. It's also your credit rating and understanding that, right? Um, then understanding, well, do we have kids? One of the interesting things, when I was married, I lived in Edgemere Park, and on the houses on either side of me kept selling within like every couple of years. Our neighbors would change because these dinks would move into our neighborhood, they would have a kid, and they'd instantly move out. Anybody know what a dink is? No. It stands for double income, no kids. So the minute they'd have a kid, they'd move out, and they'd move to Edmond. Why? Edgemere Park's in Oklahoma City. What's the school district? Oklahoma City. What's one of the poor performing school districts in the state? Oklahoma City. So the minute they had a kid, they, they wanted to move to a school district that was better. So, you know, they, they did the search then and would buy a new home. But I would argue that even with regard to these things, that maybe we're not completely rational. And I'll give you an example. My mother was a realtor. She had the largest real estate agency in northern New Mexico and a land development company. And she was one of the first, this was in the mid 70s through the 80s she was one of the first realtors and real estate companies to really professionalize it and go through and start telling people things like pull out your winter clothes if it's summer take your family photos at that point in time this will seem very foreign to you because you all are so used to a world in which facebook dominates your picture taking activities or instagram or pinterest or I don't know, what, what is the latest social media? I, I, I realize that you actually don't get on Facebook that much because why don't you get on Facebook? Your parents are on Facebook, right? And so you've gotten off of Facebook. But you've got something. I mean, how, you know, how many people go print out pictures anymore? They're all over the country. There were these studios. They were, they were a big chain, very popular, called Olin Mills Photography. And, and families would go once a year or every two years and have a family portrait done. And they would hang these with pride up the staircase, right? So that you could see the progression or down the staircase or whatever. And she was one of those that say, you know, like people need to visualize themselves, not you in this area. It's not that you want the place to be vacant, but you know, you, you want them. And now there's a whole science to this and people actually do this. They they go in and stage homes, but people don't want to picture you in the home. They want to picture themselves in the home. And in order to do that, you take out stuff that's really personal, like those family photos. You take out those clothes. So if you walk into a closet that's jam packed with every, you know the ski gear, we lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the time. There would be ski gear and then summer gear and things like that. 
you know, it, it's overwhelming. And the closet looks what? It looks cluttered and small. And so, you know, she would go through, well, we had this one house that she was listing and she went through and it was a million dollar home. And she told people, got to get rid of the carpet. The carpet's horrible. And they said, no, we'll just give them a, a, a carpeting allowance of, of $5,000. She said, people, and at that time, all carpeting, they would replace it with was beige carpeting. Beige was the big thing. Beige was, you know, was the color to have. Sort of like now you go into all these homes and you've gone around to model homes or, or flipped houses now. Everything is gray. Gray is the new beige. You know, gray carpeting, gray walls, white trim. That seems to be the new thing. And they just wouldn't do it. And finally she got him. She said, we're going to help. We had a series of open houses. And she finally got him. And she said, look, I want you to come and secret shop your, your house and listen to what people were saying. And the average home in that neighborhood was selling within two weeks, which at the time that was really home sell within days now because we have the ability to do all this online, right? That was a really good time. If a home was only on the market for two weeks, that was really, really good. And people would walk into the home and they'd go, oh, the carpet is awful. And the house down the street has new carpet. And they heard it over and over and over again. And finally, they replaced the carpet. And what they replace it with? Beige. We got them to replace it with beige, right? Because that's the that's a neutral color that, that anybody, your stuff will go with it. And we would tell people, you can, they're giving you a carpet allowance. Now, a rational, a fully rational actor would do what? They would rather have the house that needs the carpet replaced, but is going to give you a carpeting allowance because then you're going to get the carpet that what? You want, as opposed to the standard stock commercial beige carpet, right? So even in these major decisions, I'm not sure that we are completely rational. If you were, going back to my example of my neighborhood in Edgemere, if you were completely rational, most people, unlike me, I never wanted to have children. Most people want to have kids. If you thought about this for more than two seconds, you'd think, gee, we're going to have kids someday, and maybe we shouldn't go through the expense. Because if you, if you buy houses and sell them within five years, you're not making any money, really, right? You're spending a huge amount of money on real estate costs, closing, you know, and, and loan origination fees. And if you rationally think, gee, I, we're going to have kids someday, maybe we've got to think about where we're going to live rather than buying that house, right? <clears throat> so influences on consumer behavior, sociocultural influences. These are enormously important in marketing. I am not a huge breakfast person. I don't really like it. It's not my meal. I think the reason I don't really like it is it's really hard. Now, I do. I will tell you, I like to make breakfast. So we, my family owns these four bed and breakfasts in Guthrie, and I'm the executive chef for my family's business, and I make breakfast for guests a lot. Um, and I love to make breakfast because breakfast is really hard to make a really good breakfast, but I don't really enjoy eating breakfast because, again, it's really hard to make a really great breakfast. I mean, it's really hard. It's, it's sort of hard to make eggs exciting, okay? Now, I try. I do it by coming up with all kinds of omelets, and I cook omelets in the French style, which most Oklahomans have never had because they always want their eggs hard which French omelets are not hard. So my brother moves to New York. He gets a job as a tax attorney. And he says, let's go out to breakfast. He's a breakfast person. He likes breakfast. I don't like breakfast. And I said, OK, well, if I'm going to spend the calories, because I'm perpetually dieting, because I'm a foodie, I like to eat, and I like to drink beer. And so those are high caloric you know, activities. Uh, and for years and years and years and years, I ran until I broke my hip so that I could do that. So I could eat lots of food and I could drink lots of beer and I'd be okay. So we went out to eat in New York City and I was like, he's like, what do you want? I'm like, I want chicken fried steak, eggs, and biscuits and gravy. You cannot find chicken fried steak 
or biscuits. And we went all over New York City looking for them. You can't find it. You can't walk. I mean, they look at you like you're, we finally, we went to upstate New York. He had a house in Saratoga Springs and we went to upstate New York and we went to the racetrack. Saratoga is famous for its racetrack. And in the mornings, you can go have breakfast at the track and they have the morning workouts for the horses. You can watch this. And it's really a lot of fun. So we went to the track and I got like, I like was so excited because they had biscuits and gravy at the track in Saratoga until I tried the gravy and they had used turkey gravy for the gravy. It was disgusting. That's socio, like that's, they, they just don't understand. And when I've had people come from New York and I, you know, tell them like, you should try chicken fried steak. They're like, what is chicken fried steak? And I'm like, it's like chicken fried chicken, but with steak. And they're like, why would you want to do that? Yeah, because anything deep fat broth is delicious, right? I mean, that's sociocultural. Family and friends are also enormously important in this. Psychological factors. Perception is reality for the individual. And I give a number of examples of this. Since I taught political marketing for a long time, one of the examples I like to use is in political marketing. One of our former presidents named Gerald Ford, when he was president, he got sort of sick at an event and he sort of stumbled around and almost, I think he actually did fall off stage. And from that moment on, when he went to campaign for election, he's the only president, by the way, this is a trivial pursuit answer or question, he's the only president to have never been elected to either the vice presidency or the presidency. He became president because Richard Nixon had to resign in 1973 in disgrace over the Watergate scandal. But before that, Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro T. Agnew, had had to resign because he was going to federal prison for bribery charges. So Nixon looks around because he knows the times are getting tough and they're going to come after him. And he looks around for who's going to pardon him when he leaves office. And he picks Gerald Ford, this unknown congressman. Well, when Ford goes to run, this, this image of him being this sort of big, bumbling galoot catches on. You know, I think Ford was going to lose anyway, but the perception in America was that he was just this uncoordinated bowl in a china shop. And the reality couldn't have been further from the perception. Because Gerald Ford had been a college quarterback. Now, there are some positions in football that you can play if you're not terribly coordinated. But it's not quarterback. He was a fairly good dancer. That Again, that's not something you can do if you're uncoordinated. Ronald Reagan was another one. The perception of Ronald Reagan, and this is you know, in the minds of the, the voter, which is the consumer in the political marketplace. Ronald Reagan was seen as being this wonderful fatherly figure. And until he died, and now his children are rethinking their position on this, his kids hated him. He was cold and distant. This is highlighted in H.W. Brand's book on Reagan. When Reagan was running for president, he had an older family with Jane Wyman and he had these two older kids. One was adopted, Michael, and I can't remember the older girl's name. But he had these older children with Jane Wyman. They said they wanted to help their father's campaign. Reagan's campaign manager told them that if they really wanted to help their father, because he now had this younger set of kids, and they wanted to portray him in their political advertising as this youthful, vigorous person, if you really want to help your father, you'll dig a hole, bury yourself in it, and not come out until after the campaign. When the kids went to their father and told him this, his response was, well, when you hire people, you have to take their advice. What kind of dissociative psychopathology is that? I, I, I mean, 
he didn't even recognize he was he was the speaker at his son's graduation. And when his son, older son Michael, crossed the stage, didn't recognize him. <laughs> you know, but the, the the perception in the mind of the consumer or the voter was that he was this grandfatherly person. George Herbert Walker Bush, the elder Bush, got labeled as a wimp. This is a man who was shot out of an airplane and then became head of the CIA. I can tell you that you don't become head of the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States by being a wimp. But he had sort of given a speech, and at one point in time, he put his hands on his hips and started lecturing. And it was perceived as being weak. And so perception in the mind of the consumer is, is reality, and you have to think about these things. Which leads me to psychographics. So you should do this. You should go to, um, and I've got this on the website or on the uh, the uh, PowerPoint. Go to Strategic Business Insights and, and do the vowels. It's interesting. You'll you'll I think you'll like it, um, and figure out where you are. So the vowels typology comes up with a way of classifying consumers based on their access to resources and their psychological motivation. And there are two categories that sort of fall outside of this. So you've got high access to resources over here on this axis versus low. And this is on the PowerPoint. And then it's whether you're motivated by ideals, achievements, or expression, self-expression. And then there are two that sort of fall outside. So one of the ones that falls outside of these that has high but is motivated by all of these is called an innovator. So they generally put them up here. Innovators. Innovators have high access to resources, and they're sort of motivated by all of these things, by achievement, self-expression, and ideals. So what do innovators seek? They seek lots and lots of information about stuff. But they're very skeptical of advertising. So if you're going to reach, if your product is something that's new, a new technology, for example, and you want to reach innovators, how do we generally, how have we historically reached um, our consumers? Well, we've done it through advertising, but innovators are very, very skeptical of advertising. Why? Because they want lots of information. They don't believe people just because they say it's so. Right? They're future-oriented, and they have a wide variety of interests. These are the people that you'll see engaging in, you know, whitewater rafting, and then going and sailing, um, you know, piloting their own planes, things like that. So for another critical thing challenge for which you can get bonus points, think about a restaurant. This is the way I want you to think about it. If you're going to market, let's suppose that you want to market to innovators a new restaurant in Oklahoma City. What restaurants are going to be similar to what you will want to do in terms of appealing to innovators. I'll tell you, my 8 o'clock class this morning, they came up with really good examples. Sometimes I've had classes that have not come up with good examples, and I'll just give you one that came up from a class uh, several years ago. Um, not when I was teaching here, it was when I was teaching at New Mexico State. Uh, the group said that they thought innovators would like chilies. I'm just going to tell you that's wrong. <laughs> right? Like... Um, you might find innovators in Chile's office. I have, I have a friend who's definitely an innovator. He was, the, the day the iPhone was released, he was there, he had pre-ordered it. He was there to get it, right? And I said something like, that will drop in three months by half. And what are you gonna do then? He said, I, and I, when it dropped by half in price in three months, I said, was it worth it for those three months? Oh yes, it was worth it for those three months. And 
I, I knew him when I was an executive vice president at the American Education Corporation. He was our director. Um, uh, somebody says, personalized food places where you pick exactly what you want, such as specific. Example. Like Cafe 7. Okay, what's Cafe 7? I don't know what this uh, is. Cafe 7, um, basically you walk in and they have the menu like behind you and mm -hmm. there's like the kids menu and then it's divided into like pizzas, pastas, salads, sandwiches. And then I think they have like their seasonal menu. And then there's just pieces of paper. So basically it was like social distancing before that was even really a thing. Uh -huh. And you get to, you write, there's like the little golf pencils. Mm -hmm. You like color in which one you want and then you can like take the pencil and cross out what you don't want on it. And then at the bottom, there's like sides, drinks, and all that. You write your name, and then you take it to them. They give you a number, you pay, and then you just go and sit down. Okay. But it's basically like a, an a la carte menu. And so you're creating okay. your own meal. Rather than them creating a meal for you, it's it's like you're creating your own experience. Is yeah, that what you're saying? Okay. All right. I, I would buy that. Um, I'll tell you why Chili's is not the answer. So this, this guy, he was the... Marketing director, marketing communications director for the company I work for. And every once in a while, there was a Chili's restaurant that was pretty close to our offices, which were down on Broadway Extension. And we'd be like, Dave, we're going to lunch. He went to lunch with us a lot. We're like, we're going to Chili's. He's like, I am not going to Chili's. Chili's is uninspired food. And I'm a foodie, and so I, I agree with this position, but I'm like, you know, sometimes, David, we've got like a meeting in 30 minutes, and we need something that's fast. And Chili's is fast. Right, but it's it's just like a heartbeat above McDonald's, right? Just just a heartbeat above McDonald's. So um, yeah, I think that would be uh, a good example. Anybody else have an example that they think would be like Coastal Caribbean one? What's this? No, I've not heard of that one. It's like it's an ice cream place, but you can like put like Reese's in there, or, like. Okay. So you can make your own blend of whatever it is you want, rather than just having sort of the standard, you know, Brahms. This is what we've got on the menu up there. You can you can do what you want. So what did you say? Was it Coldstone? Yeah, Coldstone. Yeah, I can't hear with the mess. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, I've been to Coldstone. Yes, I think that that was at least it started out as a place that we innovators. The first Coldstone that I ever found um, was actually in the 1980s, and it was in. Um, Dallas, and it was in the Galleria, which was the very newest, at that time, the very newest upscale mall. And yes, this whole idea of, um, so Coldstone is, is, the idea is that they put the ice cream on a freezing cold slab of marble, and then they make what you want, right? And yeah, I think that would have been something that innovators would have been attracted to. And maybe even to this day, the thing about innovators is now Cold Stone has been around so long. Like at that time, I think Dallas was one of the few places you could get it. Um, innovators like new stuff, so they're constantly trying new stuff. But I think yes, you're right. I think that would be a good example, um, at least in its original um, form. You know, before it, it went like sort of like as a chain that innovators would have liked. Um, there is a restaurant in Massachusetts the called the Daily Table. They basically reduce food waste by repurposing food products slightly past its sell date into healthy, ready-to-eat meals. They provide meals at affordable prices compared to other restaurants. Yeah, I think that is something because innovators are, um, generally speaking, you know, this is not going to be the climate science denying group um, up here, and I think that would I think that absolutely would appeal to them in terms of. Huh? Someone online said Dippin' Dots. Someone online said Dippin' Dots. I think, I think yes, in the early days when Dippin' Dots were really scarce, um, that would be. And I will tell you that this is something that does happen with products. At one point in time, um, tater tots were there when they were first introduced. And I can't remember when they were first introduced. I want to say, but I think this may be wrong, that they were introduced at the Chicago world fair and they were enormously expensive because they were hard to produce at that point in time um, and so they were like a luxury item so what what people consider and that's sort of like dip and dots when they were first introduced it was very novel 
um, it was the ice cream of the future. And so, yes, I think innovators at the time that it was, um, that it was introduced would have been, if you spoke, by the way, from WebEx, you need to, to text me as well, or send me an email so I can give you, give you credit and points for that. Um, I think that is, those are good examples. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a chain that Fyro's Pizza, it's like Subway in a pizza place combined, so you can like, Make your own pizza. It's like a little personalized one. You can get them without cheese. Oh yeah, that's definitely, I think, innovative. Yeah, um, I think that's you know anything that's an experience to do. I think innovators like. Um, there's a place that we just tried not too long ago over here by Quill Springs Mall. It's the Japanese version um, of barbecue. But the barbecue is at your table. They have a barbecue like grill thing at your table with fire, and they just you tell them what proteins you want, and they bring it out and you try it and things like that. I think that would be um, hibachi. Huh? Hibachi. It's not hibachi. It's it's like these grates on the table, and hibachi is they cook it. Um, this is like you cook it. Uh, so I think that would be innovative. Uh, edible water bottles. I didn't know they had edible water bottles. They have edible Probably water bottles. Oh yeah, they bottles. do. Yeah, really? They're like these like gel capsules that you can like eat that comes in water. I think that would absolutely be something that innovators would be interested in. Yeah. yeah. Is it kind of like the melting pot? Kind of like how you said like. That's yeah. Nice. Uh, that's that's what one of the ones this morning that they came up with. Yeah. Um, so the melting pot is fondue, and I think definitely um, in the early days. And, there, and that has not expanded widely beyond uh, the Bricktown area. Yeah, lots of Oklahomans. When I was growing up in Oklahoma, um, anything besides American cheese was sort of considered communist product. Like we, you know, we're just not not going to deal with that. And the melting pot is all about fondue. It's about different kinds. So usually fondue restaurants uh, have, you know, um, they use goat cheeses and things that that are are more exotic. Um, than others. Let's see what else. Um, Texas State Brazil. I think, yeah, that would uh, be an example. Also, Fogo de Chao, which was the original one of those, the, the uh, Brazilian uh, barbecue. Um, those, again, may have become past their prime in terms of being attractive to innovators, but certainly when they started, um, Fogo de Chao and Texas State Brazil were, were very um, cutting edge and people who wanted to experience something completely different where they just bring big hunks of meat to your table um, I think was was definitely um, uh, an innovative thing at the time again innovators what what was maybe attractive even five or ten years ago um, they may have moved on because they're interested in new experiences that's what they are really about is capturing these new experiences all right, I am out of time, so we will stop there for today. Um, if you talked on WebEx, please send me an email or text. I've got the text messages from YouTube, so I will um, put those points in just as soon as I get to my office. For those of you that got ducks, as soon as I finish the live stream, please come see me, and we will get your points. Oh, just a reminder, the exam is due tonight. Today is Thursday, right? Yes. Tonight by midnight.